This video contains major spoilers for all of season two of Good Omens. This is going to be the first video in a series of character analysis and scene breakdowns, so let's kick it off with a bang. I want to ask and answer one simple yet also complex question. Why does Crowley kiss Aziraphale? To find an answer, we need to discuss that scene. No, no, that other scene. Yeah, that one. But also this one, because I believe they are fundamentally connected. Neil has stated on Tumblr that the kiss was romantic, but the ox rib scene is clearly not romantic. So what's the purpose of this weird, awkward to watch scene and how is it connected to this painful yet somehow beautiful kiss? Many of you are probably already very familiar with the idea that Crowley uses acts of service and gift giving to show affection, while Aziraphale gives trust and positive feedback to do the same. Both are well received by the other party, but Aziraphale seems to have a particularly positive response to what I'll call worldly pleasures and gifts. Books, music, and especially food. But how did this aspect of the relationship develop, and what does it mean for the two scenes in question? Starting when they first meet as angel and demon on the wall in Eden, Crowley is fascinated by this angel who seems to have his own internal moral compass, when Aziraphale admits to having given away his flaming sword. Crowley seems to see a hint of a kindred soul and a possible ally, but at the flood, when Crowley asserts that they can't kill kids, Aziraphale defaults to defending God's ineffable plan. It's clear that Aziraphale struggles with asserting his own morality when it butts up against what he believes to be God's morality, or the Great Plan. In the minisode, A Companion to Owls, Season 2, Episode 2, we get a deeper glimpse of how Aziraphale and Crowley's relationship will continue to develop over the next few thousand years. They have at this point in history not yet worked together. Crowley is unwilling to actually harm the kids, either the cute hairy ones or the cute human ones, but at first he keeps up appearances in front of Aziraphale. Aziraphale asserts that he doesn't think Crowley actually wants to harm children, and Crowley asserts that he longs to do so. Now, I can't be certain exactly what happened here. Did Crowley let the goat out of the bag on purpose, or was Aziraphale simply clever enough to spot the ruse? In either case, the reveal of the completely unharmed goats assures Aziraphale of Crowley's true intentions. But, and this is key, Crowley is not yet sure of Aziraphale's. Remember, it's heaven that wants to kill the kids, and Aziraphale is heaven's emissary, and he defended the position at the flood. Crowley has had some hints in their past interactions that Aziraphale might be open to having a different opinion than what Heaven says, but he hasn't yet actively defied or thwarted the will of God. Later, when Crowley starts threatening the kids with fire, Aziraphale does not back down as he did the first time in the yard with the ravens disguised as goats. Instead, he shows very strong faith in Crowley, and I think this is a pivotal moment for Crowley. Are you sure, Angel? Yes. Quite sure. The faith Aziraphale shows in him, even when Crowley is trying to push him away, is the catalyst that causes Crowley to seek his own way of connecting back to Aziraphale. They aren't a team yet, but the possibility is now there. So how can he sway Aziraphale, stubborn, silly angel that he is? Verbal appeals have so far been an utter failure. He does try offering wine, which is hilariously declined. Yeah, what? And then the scene. He offers him food. Nothing sinful about food, right, Angel? Aziraphale tries it, and at first, he's horrified. A few moments later, though, the hook is set. The expression on Crowley's face as he watches Aziraphale eat is admittedly almost lecherous, but I think it's because he's learned what Aziraphale responds to. This newfound love of food can be used to motivate Aziraphale to see things from Crowley's and his own perspective instead of Heaven's. I'm not judging Crowley for using this tool, by the way. Is it a bit manipulative? Yes, but these aren't perfect beings, and I think Crowley does see it as gift-giving. In the end, with just a look and based on the trust they've recently developed, Crowley is able to help Aziraphale face the difficult moral dilemma at the end of the minisode and make the right choice. His angel With your curly little and unique one. is willing to sacrifice himself to save a few human children. This is the first time they work together, the very foundation of the relationship they form as angel and demon. And I think that's the deeper purpose of showing the audience this scene. Their very first earthly partnership is founded on Aziraphale showing trust and faith in Crowley with verbal positive reinforcement 
and Crowley giving Aziraphale a worldly and pleasurable gift, in this instance, food. And this is a pattern they will repeat throughout history. Leading up to the present day, Crowley must notice that it's Aziraphale who almost always reaches out to touch him. In the past, Crowley has offered a handshake, but Aziraphale is the one to take it, the one to touch his arm or his chest. And in the present time, Aziraphale just gave away some of his precious books and went to a lot of trouble organizing a ball that was ostensibly for Nina and Maggie, but let's be honest, it was mostly an excuse to hold Crowley's hand and dance with him for a few minutes. Aziraphale is romantic at heart, as we know by his familiarity with the literary works of Jane Austen. He's an angel who seeks out and responds positively to worldly pleasures, books, food, music, and touch. Throughout time, we see Crowley use the same tactic over and over. The temptation accomplished is sort of a running joke, but it's also true. Crowley offers lunch in revolutionary France. He offers to get people to come to Hamlet, a favorite play of Aziraphale's. When Aziraphale is upset by a paint stain, Crowley cleans it off his coat. He eventually lets him drive the car, his own prized possession, in season two. He helped him perform the dangerous magic bullet catch on stage in 1941. And most notably, Crowley saves his books in the church bombing, which according to Michael Sheen, the actor who plays Aziraphale, is the moment he believes Aziraphale finally falls in love with Crowley. And Crowley uses material gifts to sway Aziraphale as well. When Aziraphale seems about to back out of the deal in season one, Crowley offers him lunch again. When Aziraphale says he thinks a heavenly victory would be grand after Crowley tells him about the Antichrist, Crowley reminds him that all the good composers are in hell and he won't have his favorite restaurants or his bookshop. He does this to help remind Aziraphale of all the wonderful things their life together has to offer and to get him back on their side. And Aziraphale always responds positively to Crowley in return for these gifts. But the ox rib scene really hammers this all home. This is how Crowley first learned to deal with Aziraphale. And from that point on, it's almost always how Crowley gets the stubborn angel to see reason. It's his go-to move. And up until now, it's always worked. On a separate but related point throughout season two, we see that both Crowley and Aziraphale have a very misguided understanding of romantic love, shaped quite heavily by human fiction books and movies. Their own understanding of how to relate to each other is also affected by their ongoing relationship with humanity. It's Maggie and Nina who help Crowley to understand that what he's been feeling for perhaps thousands of years is what humans call love. He's felt it, yes, but he's never thought about it in those terms. So all of a sudden, he's trying to understand his own feelings in this new context. His understanding of the concept of love relates back to how humans express it. And again, his understanding of that seems mostly to come from movies and other fiction. Just as Aziraphale understands love through the lens of Jane Austen. And yes, to complicate things, they are also both extremely poor communicators. They each have a shorthand they use to reach each other when words fail them. With Aziraphale, it's showing that enduring faith and trust with a lovely side of positive reinforcement, even when Crowley protests it. And on some level, Crowley appreciates and even needs this, despite his constant protestations that he is not good, kind, or nice. With Crowley, as we've just shown, it's acts of service and gift giving. Now back to this scene, where Aziraphale has just expressed quite clearly that he wants to be with Crowley, but also that he intends to take the job in heaven. Crowley makes his own offer, asking Aziraphale to run off with him, which by definition would mean abandoning the bookshop. But when he meets resistance from Aziraphale, he uses his go-to move, you can't leave this bookshop, pointing out something the angel loves materially. Now clearly in this instance, what Crowley means is, you can't leave me. But Aziraphale sadly takes it too literally, and for the first time that we have seen, the gambit fails Crowley. After Aziraphale begs him to stay, Crowley does stop when they have more heartbreaking miscommunication. Aziraphale shows that moment of weakness when Crowley presses him about not hearing the nightingales, and his face crumples in pain, and he turns away to hide his tears. He's conflicted. Finally, we reach the point of this entire video. The question posed was, why does Crowley kiss Aziraphale? And the answer is, what does Crowley always do when Aziraphale is conflicted in this way and he needs to win him back to their side? He makes a material offer. His beloved bookshop already wasn't enough. I honestly think at this point Crowley was acting pretty much on instinct. This wasn't a calculated move on his part. 
It's how he's learned to always deal with Aziraphale when they're at odds. This kiss is the same offer as the ox rib, but a thousand times more desperate because it's personal now, and he clearly fears he's about to lose Aziraphale forever. So it's all or nothing, caution thrown completely to the wind. And what has he learned from human fiction? One fabulous kiss and they'll be good, right? This kiss is saying, I love you through touch. A material thing that Aziraphale has shown interest in that Crowley hasn't yet given him in return. Aziraphale's reaction is much the same as in the Job minisode. Confusion, pleasure, disgust, all mixed up. He doesn't know how to process it yet, and he never really gets a chance to do so before the Metatron barges in. Twice, Aziraphale almost doesn't go. The desperate kiss, the I love you said without words, almost worked, though poor Crowley doesn't know it. As to why it didn't work, that's a topic I plan to cover in my next video. What do you think about these two scenes? Do you think they're related in this way, or am I reading too much into it? Please leave your comment below and tell me what you think. As a side note, I believe Aziraphale starts to say I love you directly after the kiss. Do you see it? If so, do you think it's because he thinks it's expected of him, like in the human romances, Jane Austen? Or is it his first and truest reaction before he resorts to the dreaded, I forgive you? If you like this video, you might like one of these videos up top. I look forward to reading the comments and discussion down below. And also, let me know what you'd like me to cover next. I'd also like to thank my friend Emily for all of her help on this video and for encouraging me to keep working on this channel. I don't think I would be doing this without her help and encouragement. Thanks for watching.